you'll have to stand on the second row. <laughs> Here's a fun to your friends. <laughs> Settle down. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Trinity. Take out your bulletin and let's highlight a few things that's happening around here the next week or so. I'd like to give a special welcome to anyone that's uh, here maybe for the first time. We have a form there. We'd invite you to fill that out and place it in an offering plate. Uh, we'd really appreciate that. Please also notice the area where anyone may make, may make reservations for this Wednesday night dinner. I think uh, it's stroganoff this week. Pretty good stro. Yeah, I hear you. Mm, I like stroganoff. Ain't nothing wrong with stroganoff at church. Uh, a few things happening here today. Our prime timers and youth will have lunch in the youth room. Uh, DR Mission Trip, DR Mission Trip Interest Lunch. If you're interested in going to the Dominican Republic uh, and you didn't get, come to the lunch last week, we've got pizza for you and all kinds of information. It'll be in C108. That's right outside the youth room. We got a shower this afternoon for Emily Ford and Andrew Francis in the Fellowship Hall from 1 to 3 p.m. And did I get that right? Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's give them a hand for coming to church. Hey. Andrew's been known to make an entrance. Way to go, Andrew. Just a rehearsal. Thank you. As part of our regular evening, uh, Sunday evening rotation schedule, uh, tonight is a Sabbath schedule, so we will not have any events here at the church tonight. And also there's a second and, uh, second and third grade Sunday school fellowship up in the loft immediately following this service from 11.30 to 1 p.m. And the theme is Fiesta. Uh, at this time, I'd invite you to stand, turn to the person near you, and greet them with the peace of Christ.
thank you, Nikki, and all the work you do with them. I've had the privilege, uh, especially when I was a campus minister, to do uh, premarital counseling with many couples, and I've always enjoyed that. As part of this, sometimes we would do the Myers-Briggs personality inventory. Many of y'all have taken that device before. On a few occasions, the couples would take the test and then bring it back in, and they'd have some comments like this. How do we do? Are we compatible? Did we pass? <laughs> Can we still get married? <laughs> And I'd say, well, we need to talk about it. More importantly, y'all need to talk about it. Um, but it was a lot of fun working with those students. Hear these words from Genesis. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will be one flesh. Today we focus on marriage and relationships. I'm glad you're here at Trinity this morning. Would you pray with me, please? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this beautiful sanctuary where we can come and worship you, sing songs of praise, and pray for one another. We pray, Father, that you would bless our leaders today as they, Brother Mike brings the word and the musicians sing for us. We pray, Father, that you would continue to bless us, bless this church, and bless Brother Mike as he brings the message. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a little bit different today. At this time, our pre-K and kindergartners are invited to exit for children's worship. As we sing together our hymn of community, hymn number 613, the servant song, please stand as we sing together. Travelers on a journey, fellow pilgrims on the road. We are here to help each other walk the mile and bear the load. I will hold the Christ light for you in the night time of your fear. I will hold my out to you, speak the peace you long to hear. Sister, let me be your servant, let me be as Christ to you, that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. Brother, let me be your servant. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. I will weep when you are weeping. When you laugh, I'll laugh with you. I will share your joy and sorrow till we seen this journey through. When we sing to God in heaven, we shall find such harmony. Born of all we've known together, of Christ's love and agony. Please be seated. I ran across this uh, this week in Brian McLaren's new book. I wanted to share it with you. Uh, what we all want is pretty simple, really. We want to be alive, to feel alive. 
not just to exist, but to thrive, to live out loud, walk tall, breathe free. We want to be less lonely, less exhausted, less conflicted or afraid, more awake, more grateful, more energized and purposeful. So we capture this kind of mindful, overbrimming life in terms like well-being, shalom, blessedness, wholeness, and aliveness. As we pray silently together, remember those things that God has placed in your life that make you feel most alive. God, we often spend a lot of time on things that add nothing to or even take away from our feelings of aliveness or being close to you. Bring to our minds and hearts your purpose for us and your calling on our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. This morning I'll be reading the scripture. It's Deuteronomy 22, 9 through 12. And it's page 4, I'm sorry, 141 in the Pew Bible. Do not plant two kinds of seed in your vineyard. If you do, not only the crops that you plant, but also the fruit of the vine of the vineyard will be defiled. Do not plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. Do not wear clothes of wool and linen woven together. Make tassels on the four corners of the cloak that you wear. May God bless the reading of his word. Please stand and sing for fear your love with us. here today to share our missions moment. So, Escaño Puguero is supportive and palliative care oncology chaplain at Baylor All Saints Medical Center in Fort Worth, Texas. Pray that God opens the door of the people's hearts as Puguero's team meets physical, spiritual, and emotional needs through counseling and humanitarian service in North Haiti, Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic, and Fort Worth, Texas. In North Haiti, the team works with churches in the areas of Cap Haitien, Savannah Square, Bafose, and La Suisse. Pray for strength and wisdom for the pastors and protection and provisions for the children. In Santo Domingo, they minister in Los Preditos. Pray for the Children's Church, which is hosting around 100 children from the area, and the leaders guiding the work. 
In Fort Worth, they minister in the downtown area and in neighboring sectors. Pray for workers to help meet the needs of the unreached of Fort Worth. Please pray silent with me. Amen.
was beautiful. Well, I found out this week just how much the church staff loves me and you. I was about to step off the curb into oncoming traffic and they jerked me back. By that I mean I had selected a different scripture passage to read for this morning from the book of Deuteronomy. And they wisely steered me away from that with impassioned and reasoned pleas. Something that said like, nobody's going to be able to hear the sermon after they've been struck by that Bible passage that we read on Sunday morning in church. We're dealing with the sixth commandment in the book of Deuteronomy. That commandment says, you shall not commit adultery. And it deals with the most intimate parts of our lives and in our sexuality. And the way Deuteronomy decides to deal with this is to create these case studies of applying this commandment to the things that they faced in their culture. And it is very disturbing if you read it. You may want to read on a little further. I've stopped here. So I picked this passage that you heard earlier from Kristen having to do with not mixing the kinds of seeds in a certain row of your garden or not yoking two different kinds of animals to work and plow and to have certain kinds of cloths on your clothing and, and nobody could get upset with having tassels sewn onto their outfits probably. It's not very threatening, is it? These ancient people of Deuteronomy lived in a very different culture than us. And what we're looking at over this series of sermons on the Ten Commandments is how they took these commandments of God and apply them in very practical ways to the things and issues that they faced in that day and time. They're trying to build a nation. And as they build their nation in the promised land, they also want to have a foundation for the moral fabric of that nation. And they want that foundation to be built on God's Word and the commandments we know as the Ten Commandments. So what we've been doing on Sunday mornings is trying to look at Deuteronomy and say, how did they take those Ten Commandments and try to apply it into their daily lives so that we can maybe get some lessons for how we can take the commands of God today and apply it to the realities that we face that are often very different. How can we make the Word of God relative to the issues we face in our world today if we want to do that? But when we look at Deuteronomy and we read some of that stuff that they wrote and the things that they were doing, it can often seem very barbaric to us and very strange and certainly very harsh we are dealing with a culture that is centered around men and uh, skewed toward the males of that society. And it is very violent society in that ancient times. So if you want to read Deuteronomy 22 and 23, you are welcome to do that. But I'm not going to do it today here. I will say to you that some people who read those passages and those applications will be so disgusted that they will not want to deal with it any longer. But I do invite you to wrestle with the Scripture. Do not avoid it. When I was growing up, almost every other weekend, my parents, my mom, would take us to my dad's. That was part of the divorce decree. So every other weekend, my brother and I would go and we would stay with my dad. But usually we stayed at my grandmother's house, Mama Bobby, who lived in Gadsden. And... I knew the time we would go and the place we would go, but custody issues in, that, in our family at that time were pretty difficult. And the decree said this is what was going to happen, but there was a lot of conflict. So the conflict rose to a place where at some point the judge stepped in and said, you can no longer visit the properties of each other. So you now had to find this neutral spot, and that's what they did. So the judge picked this neutral spot, which was a church parking lot, almost midway between my dad, where he lived in Gadsden, and my mom's in Hoax Bluff. And we knew that according to the decree at every other Friday at 5 o'clock, and then till Sunday at 5 o'clock, we would meet at that parking lot for what we affectionately call the prisoner exchange. And in many ways, what that judge had done in that decree was to set boundaries. We knew what time we had to be there, and we knew what place. And the boundaries were set in order to keep peace in a situation that could certainly rise to the level of conflict. When the people of Deuteronomy are settling this land they call the Promised Land, they set boundaries too. They draw lines on a map, and they set up these markers so that the 12 tribes of Israel, though they're all one, could also have problems. And so they drew boundary lines so that certain groups could have their own sections of the promised land. You know how that works, don't you? Good fences, 
make good neighbors. And so it was a boundary to keep the peace. But they didn't stop there. They decided to also draw boundaries in their society, in their workings of community, of living together in their nation. So they drew boundaries that they thought would help protect what they believed God had created in order to the world. This is the way God created the world. This is how things are. And to make sure people don't cross those boundaries in society, they put, they put boundary lines up for them, laws and commandments and interpretations of those. So social chaos would not break out. So they didn't want people to mix things that God did not intend to be mixed, not to pollute or to adulterate those things. So for the sake of order and society, they took this sixth commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, and they applied it to nature, things in nature. They applied it to our sexuality and our intimate lives, and they applied it to the purity of who could be included in the community called God's people. So if you're looking for family values, in these sections of Deuteronomy, for today, you're going to have a hard time trying to find it there. We are not talking necessarily about the Bible in this section teaching us about healthy marriages, per se. We're talking about people who lived in a culture and time where it was all biased toward males, toward men. And it was biased in such a way that, that in one of the case studies, there is a groom on the wedding night who decides he doesn't want to be married to this woman, but they've already gotten married. So the next day he claims that she has been an adulteress, that she has committed premarital adultery, something very much a taboo and crossed the boundary lines of that time. And he could have, he could have secretly or sort of privately divorced her. You remember Joseph was going to take that option with Mary, the mother of Jesus. When he, when he found out Mary was pregnant with Jesus, he, the Bible says, was going to quietly set her aside. And I think that's out of love for her and out of the kind of person he probably was. But not this guy. This guy wanted to publicly shame this woman. And in doing so, he wanted to keep the money, the dowry, from her father. So he was going to shame the woman and he's going to shame her father by claiming that he raised a wild daughter in that day and time. But it's all false. This guy is not telling the truth. And as much as we may dislike what Deuteronomy does in these chapters, it is a progressive leap forward for the rights of women. It gives her a chance and her family a chance to clear her name by doing something we probably don't even want to talk about in church. But it gives them an opportunity to prove her innocence. But still, it is still very public. It goes before everybody. Everybody in town will know about this situation and about her very private, intimate self. And if he has proven false, his punishment is he's got to stay married to her. Now, if you're the woman in that situation, imagine how you'd feel where the guy's punished by having to stay married to you. He's the guy that accused you of being false. So it's still not very clean. It's very messy, isn't it? When I counsel couples today who are preparing for marriage, I tell them that in the ceremony itself, be prepared. There may be a glitch that will happen. And I know, Andrew, you guys are here today, but just, you know, it could happen. And there will be something maybe unintentionally funny. Maybe you will be the only ones that will know it as a couple. But it, it will happen. And you know that things happen. A ring bearer will come down the aisle and get very fidgety and people will notice that. Or, as often the case when I'm standing here just with the groom and everybody's coming in, the groomsmen oftentimes will like to make faces that only he and I can see to try to get the groom to crack up or laugh as they walk in. You never know what you'll see at a wedding from the stance where I am. And you know, there's all kinds of videos about wedding bloopers, right? We've seen some of those. I actually could have been in one one time when I was in Kentucky, pastoring my church there while I was in seminary. I did a wedding, and at one point in the wedding, I asked the best man for the ring to give. The groom's going to take it and give it to his bride-to-be. And I said to the groom these words, Please take this ringer and put it on her finger. <laughs> it was a low moment. And the bride, who was already very nervous, it was the funniest thing she had ever heard. <laughs> so she started laughing and she did one 360 spin and ducked down one time before she could really get her composure back. <laughs> and I was very red in the face. And to this day at every wedding ceremony, particularly the ones that I perform, I always think about, please, Lord, don't let me say, place this ringer <laughs> on her finger. 
Well, we've, most of us have been to weddings before, and we know that in weddings, the, oftentimes the father of the bride gets to walk her down the aisle. And I never say, when he comes there to, to me as the minister, who comes to give the bride away? I always say, who comes to present the bride? And often, if there's a couple, he will say, her mother and I. These people in Deuteronomy wanted it to be, who comes to give the woman away? Because they saw the woman as being owned in many ways as the property of the leading dominant male figure in her life. So I just don't like that too much. And, and one of the things that I notice sometimes in weddings is there's usually these candles that are set up. There's three of them on a candelabra there. And oftentimes the way that happens is the parents for each child who's going to be married, they will come and light those candles signifying the life and the light of their, ch of their children who will be joined together in marriage. And there's a really great image that will happen during the ceremony where the couple will come down and each one will take the candle representing their life and light the center candle. And then they'll blow out those candles and put them back in. They call that a unity candle. And it's a wonderful image of the two becoming one. But I often, when I'm doing premarital counseling with them, say, let's consider not blowing out the candles. Just leave them all lit. And let's call it a trinity candle. Because maybe let's think about the image of inviting all of who God is to be at the center of your life, your life as a couple together. And I really have never necessarily liked the idea that when you get married, you blow out the candle that represents the uniqueness of who you are in this life. When Mary and I were married, the minister said something to us in the ceremony about allowing spaces to exist in our relationship together. And he read a poem, and one of the lines of the poem says this, For the pillars of the temple stand apart, and the oak tree and the cypress grow, but not in each other's shadow. Now, in this coming year, Mary and I will celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary. And I, I can just say to you very honestly the way we feel. We feel like we have a wonderful married life together, a lot to celebrate, and a great sense of love and happiness of these 25 years that we've been together. But one of the things that I think has been key for us is to allow those spaces to exist. We did not blow ourselves out in our uniqueness when we joined together. We are close and tight, but we've always thought it important to encourage each other in the pursuits that God has for our lives and to allow those spaces for those things to happen, not for one of us to overshadow the others. In fact, we felt like that's one of the ways we're faithful to each other in our marriage. You know, these ancient people didn't see it that way. They saw the bride, the woman, as a second-class citizen. It's just the culture of the time, and the culture invaded their understanding at that point. And so when the contract of marriage was broken, they always said the contract's not between the man and the woman. The contract was between her daddy and the guy who married her. The women could blow out their candles because their identity was connected to whoever the leading man was in their lives. But here's the key. Before you and I to sort of dismiss this stuff as ancient, backward stuff from way back in the past, we need to take an honest look at how we do today in relationships. You know, we can look at them and say they're barbaric and we're very advanced. We're a lot better modern people than those ancient people are. And in a lot of ways, we're right. There's no doubt. But in a lot of ways, we have a lot, much to learn about fidelity and about care and about how to do relationships with the most intimate person that we can share a life with together. I remember in the movie Jerry Maguire, many of you have seen that movie, there's a woman in there named Dorothy Boyd. Dorothy is married to Jerry, who's a sports agent. And at the end of the movie, they seem to have a really good married life together, and they've come together and found completeness in each other. But early on, there are some struggles in their relationship. And at one point, she says to her sister, on the surface, everything looks fine. I'm married to this really great guy, and he loves my kid, and he likes me a lot, but I can't live like that. It's not the way I'm built. And so she goes to Jerry, and she talks to him about the possibility of dis dissolving this marriage, and Jerry replies to her, no, 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 I stick. And she says, I don't want you to stick. I deserve more than that in my relationship. You know, I think when we read some of the stuff in Deuteronomy and that ancient culture and that society and its violence and so forth, we're rightfully disgusted, but before we disparage them and push them to the sidelines, we need to take a good look in the mirror ourselves and consider how well we do today in the human relationship department 
And I think if we're honest, we know none of us have really got it all together as much as we might pretend to have. The University of Michigan had a study that came out this week. It was a study that lasted 30 years. And they were, they were looking at the ability of college generation students, college students, and their ability to empathize with other people. And they found a declining ability of students over those 30 years to be able to, to see and understand the point of view of another human being, especially if they were quite different from their cultural upbringing. The ability to have empathy was declining among them. Or just turn on ESPN if you want to. If you turn on ESPN, which is a sports television network, you'll hear as much about domestic violence today and about parenting and about relationships and about love and all that stuff as you will offensive schemes and blitz packages in football. Even this week, the commissioner of the National Football League had a press conference and he stood up and he talked about the role of domestic violence in the league and he was sort of pleading, I think, for his job and he said, I got it wrong. I got it wrong when I tried to address this issue. The truth is we all struggle, no matter how good we are, with deep and close relationships. In the United States, we rate eighth globally in the number of murders committed every year. And almost all of those murders are between people who knew each other. We rate ninth in the world of reported rapes in the world. And, and as we think about divorce, we know that percentage hovers around 45% or so. It is a little smaller for people of faith who attend a community of faith and are actively involved in it, but still it's a lot. And people who get divorced and remarry have a much higher rate even of divorce the second time. I'm just saying to you that it's hard, isn't it? If we're honest, we know it's difficult and it takes work to be in a relationship and to be intimate with someone and to share our hearts with someone. And if we're also honest, we know that we're not quite as good at it as we think we are. Before we point fingers at Deuteronomy, we need to think about how we do it. The truth is that we all need help. Every one of us in this room needs help. And so like so much of life, when these people in Deuteronomy are describing their culture and their day and their, tra their attempts to interpret the scripture for their lives, we find all this cultural bias invading it and we don't like it a lot. But what we see if we look at it faithfully in the scriptures is that God works in that bias nonetheless. God never stops working even when we get things wrong. So one of the things that they did was to draw a boundary about the kind of people who could be included in their community of faith. And one group that they said crossed a boundary and could not be included were eunuchs. And they said those people were outcasts. They could not be apart. They crossed a boundary. And then later as we read our Bible, we will come to the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah dreams of a day when people who are handicapped, people who have disabilities, people who are outcast, people who are sinful by the rules of the boundaries of the past, he dreams of a day when they can be included and be called a part of the kingdom of God. And then when we get to the New Testament in the book of Acts, it actually happens. It happens. In the book of Acts, there's actually a guy, an Ethiopian eunuch, who has gone to Jerusalem to worship God. Now, he probably, because of the fences at the temple courts, was only allowed to be at the very outer part of the temple. He couldn't get really close to the altar of God because he was Ethiopian and he was a eunuch. But still, he got as close to God as he could get on earth in Jerusalem. And then the Bible says, as he's headed back, on his way back to Ethiopia, he finds himself on a lonely wilderness road, way out of the way from anything, and on that road, God sends one of the early Christian preachers, a guy named Philip, who also had daughters who preached. And Philip comes up and listens to this Ethiopian eunuch in his carriage, and he hears him reading from the prophet Isaiah. And he comes up to him as he hears that, and he tells him about Jesus. And he tells him about hope. And he tells him about true love. And he tells him about acceptance. And he tells him about baptism. And after all of that, this Ethiopian eunuch, he looks over and he sees a body of water and he says these very famous words, Here is water. Is there anything to prevent a person like me from coming to Christ? And the answer is, there is nothing that would prevent a person like him. And he is baptized. And he does belong 
in the kingdom that Jesus taught us about. In Jesus' kingdom, tax collectors belong, harlots belong, people who are outcasts belong. Jesus never turned anybody away who wanted to come and be a part of God's family. Jesus never turns you away either. No matter what you think you've done or who other people say you are, you are welcome in the kingdom and the vision that Jesus taught for his world. You know, you know the story in the New Testament where a woman was actually caught in adultery in the act. And we don't know about the guy because we still got a lot of bias, don't we? But they bring the woman to Jesus and they say to him, we know what the folks of Deuteronomy and Leviticus said. We know the law and she deserves, since she's been caught in the act of committing adultery, to have people throw rocks at her until she dies, to stone her to death. And they do that, you know because they want to test Jesus. Because Jesus has already demonstrated by his life that he welcomes sinners. He does not avoid us. He is a friend to people like you and me. And he welcomes us, people who get relationships, but we mess it up a lot too. And he welcomes us and he's demonstrated that. So they want to test him with this woman caught in adultery. You know, somebody said, if you think you've got God all figured out, then Jesus is going to be awfully annoying to you. And sometimes his church is called a hospital for sinners. So there's Jesus drawing in the dirt, these people holding their rocks, bringing this test case, this woman who has no meaning to them, just a test case to her, to Jesus. And Jesus gently says, OK, you guys holding the rocks. Whoever has no sin, you throw the first stone. And you know the story in the New Testament. The oldest people who had lived the longest with the most life experience dropped their stones first until everybody is gone except for Jesus and this woman sitting there in the dirt. And Jesus lifts her up, literally lifts her up, lifts her gaze and says to her, I do not condemn you. I accept you and I love you, but I ask you to go and live the best life you can live. Do not sin anymore. This is grace, but it's not cheap grace. This is God's grace. This is the grace that God demonstrated to us by the literal death of Jesus on the cross, by His blood and by His suffering. It is the grace of God that He bought and offers to each one of us sinners in this room even today. And He asks us to live the best life that we can live, live a better life. And the only way really we can do that is to not try to build it all by ourselves. We need help. And help is offered from God to each of us. And if you're that sinner today, you need to know that God will not turn you away. You are welcome. Your relationships are hard. Sharing our hearts with somebody and struggling through that is very difficult. And a lot of people we know, and maybe it's you in this room, you've had hurt and hardship and pains all in the effort to love somebody else or to have them love you and accept you deeply. I think Deuteronomy got something that sometimes we forget. And that is that God cares about those places in our hearts. God cares about our hearts. God cares about the most intimate needs and desires of our lives. God will not avoid what we often do avoid. And God knows that our relationships mean that we have to take risks and sometimes we get hurt and it's very private and we don't share it with people. But God knows we need a home for our heart. And He wants that home to be peaceful. And He wants it to be a place where we can be loved and cared for. So God says, do not adulterate the most intimate relationships that you have in this world with another human being. And why does God say that? Because God cares. He cares about every deep part of your identity and who you are. And He gives you help. He gives us all help. Jesus teaches us that the better way is to forgive each other. He teaches us to look more at the log jams in our own eyes than in the specks that cause us to judge even those we love the most in the world. He teaches us how to lift people up and encourage rather than to stone people down in this world. He teaches us how to work to build up, not tear down. You know, after the Columbine shootings several years ago, Larry King had Billy Graham on CNN. And Larry King had had all these people talking about how could something like that happen. 
in, in these schools. And it's happened since then, as you know. And many people, according to Larry King in his interview, had talked about reasons or causes of why these things had happened. Some said, because our kids are exposed to so much violence these days, they're, they're immune to it. And others said it's the proliferation of the access to guns. And some said it's poor parenting. There were all these lists of stuff. When he asked Billy Graham, this is how Billy Graham began his answer. He said, thousands of years ago, a young couple in love lived in a garden called Eden. And in that garden, God planted a tree and told them not to eat from the fruit of that tree. But they did. And you know the rest of that story. We repeat it over and over again in our lives. We live in a fallen world. Relationships are hard in a fallen world. And try as we might, we oftentimes have messy relationships. Rules are good. Standards are good. Marriage covenants are good. But we all fall short in the most private and intimate places of our lives. We need help. We need Jesus. As I was preparing this sermon, there was a song that came on the radio. You might have heard it before. It said, the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon and little boy blue is a man on his own. And he's become just like me. And that's awfully convicting for a lot of us. Because everybody carries around some guilt in relationships. Everybody has some shame. Everybody has blame, dark places, hurting places, because all of us have messy relationships. But there is another song you might have heard too. And you probably won't hear it on the radio. You'll only hear it at church. And that song says, Wider than snow. Yes, wider than snow. It says that Jesus, God, has washed me. And now I am wider than snow. God wants to be at the center. God wants to be in the most intimate parts of your life. Because God cares about you. God wants to be in the places where your heart is concerned. Listen, God cares. And God cares deeply about our hearts. God cares about how we get along with each other. Our friends in church, the people we work with, go to school with. God cares about that man you love or that woman you love, about your parents and about your children in this world. From the very beginning, God has demonstrated God cares. Do not commit adultery in the most intimate relationships of your life. There are hearts involved here. God cares about your heart. God cares about your relationships. And I believe, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that if you will let God, God will make a difference in the places where your hearts are most invested. May it be so. Amen. Hello, I'm Mike Oliver. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. I'd like to thank you for joining us for worship through our church website. And also, I'd like to invite you to come and visit us. This is a great church. We have friendly people here. We value worship. We value community and global missions. And there are programs for children all the way to senior adults. I think you'll like our church, and I hope you'll come and visit us and see for yourself in person. If you have questions about our church, like to know more, we'd love for you to contact us. There's information on our website. You can call us or email us or come by, and one of our staff members will be glad to talk with you. Welcome to Trinity, and God bless you and keep you.